legislation tonight. Also here on your election command center, some Ghanaian students on government scholarship abroad stranded some risk deportation over unpaid fees. Tonight we'll tell you the harrowing stories of these students who are now pleading with government to come to their aid. Stay with us here on Ghana Tonight. We have that story for you and it's quite heart-wrenching to say the least. Uh, what, what we're hearing from some of these students on government scholarship and what they've had to do to survive. Stay with us. We have a conversation with one of them joining us here on Ghana Tonight from the United States here on Ghana Tonight. As always, you are an integral part of the show. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and on X. Let's get talking. Well, let's settle for Ghana Briefs. While a Wale member of parliament, Lairo Bazuera, has withdrawn from the race to be the party's candidate for the December polls after chaotic rerun, which ended inconclusively, the NP has been explaining the decision to withdraw. Following the inconclusive of yesterday's premise or rerun, now the EC was not able to declare a winner. So based on that, I've decided that I want to step down and will not go contest the seat again. Former chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Dr. Akweju Afarijan, is proposing a treasonable charge on election officials who commit electoral offences with the aim of tampering with the will of the people. He said such professional persons know the consequences of their actions and must not be allowed to go scot-free. Dr. Afarijan was speaking at the ongoing Ghana Bar Association conference in Kumasi. Persons who commit serious election offences particularly if they are professional election officials or electronic experts, must be severely punished for attempting to undermine the will of the people. The Ghana Integrity Initiative has admonished the political class to crack the whip on persons engaged in legal mining. Its executive director, Mary Ada, on the sidelines of a climate change conference in Accra, says the lack of sanction is a contributory factor for which people engage in the activity with impunity. It is an issue of lack of knowledge, but it is also an issue of lack of compliance and sanctioning. And the fact that corruption continues to breed some of these behaviors, it is an issue of lack of political will. The Ministry of Local Government, Decentralization and Rural Development has launched the Local Economic Development Policy 2024-2029, an implementation plan to coordinate and facilitate development at the local level. The five-year economic development plan, among other things, requires MMDEs to focus on optimizing local resources to create opportunities that enables a conducive local business environment for all actors. The implementation of the 2020 led policy faced a few implementation challenges, which includes limited understanding of the concepts of LED, diverse interests and perspectives of stakeholders, poor leadership, especially at the MMDA level, to drive LED initiatives, limited resources to promote LED initiatives, and the bureaucratic local regulations and process resulting in slow or some extent stored LED actions. The founder of Collapsed UT Bank has expressed his belief that it was economically unsound to use $6 billion in the banking sector cleanup and then subsequently seek a $3 billion bailout from the International Monetary Fund. Speaking on business focus, Prince Samwabin emphasized that the collapse of indigenous companies can act as a disincentive to entrepreneurship. Take the financial sector. The figure is that they used 25 billion to sanitize, for the lack of a better word, the financial sector. And then 
And that was about six billion at the time, dollars. Soon after that, a year or two after that, you rush to IMF to borrow three billion under critical attempts, and they hold you by the balls for three billion, and you threw away six billion just two years prior to that. What kind of judgment is it? It doesn't make sense to me. More than 500 suicide attempts are said to have been made in the last six months, with 81 deaths recorded. Experts have described the trend as disturbing, calling for urgent measures to put the situation under control. Experts have described the trend as disturbing, calling for urgent measures to put the situation under control. In Ghana, about 81 lives have been lost to suicide, with more than 500 attempted suicides in the first half of this year alone. This statistic is alarming when compared to the total recorded for the entire year of 2023. This morning is on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, that developing story we've been following over the last five hours. Uh, that withdrawal of the incumbent member of parliament for the Wale Wale constituency, the home constituency of the flag bearer of the MPP, Hajia Zueratu Lariba, from the Wale Wale MPP primary finality to the troubles of the party in the constituency that's the question we're asking tonight and well we got this information just some four hours ago the Wale Wale member of parliament Lariba Zuera has withdrawn from the race to be the party's candidate for the December polls after chaotic rerun which ended inconclusive and the member of parliament has been explaining the decision to withdraw from the race and you recall yesterday the electoral commission took a decision to annul that election because of the violence that we saw. But this is the Member of Parliament speaking to her supporters. Take a look. Following the inconclusive of yesterday's promise or rerun, now the EC was not able to declare a winner. So based on that, based on that, I've decided that I want to step down and will not go contest the seat again. I am doing this for the sake of the Greater New Patriotic Party and Walwale <coughs> constituency. I'm doing this for the sake of unity, peace, love for the constituency. Well, so she, before this, this video, which we got uh, uh, some few hours ago, she had issued a statement explaining, in fact, announcing the decision to withdraw. We've got portions of that statement earlier issued by Hajar Larabazura, and she says, quote, I have decided that in the interest of the greater good of the new patriotic party and peace and unity in the Wale Wale constituency, I will no longer be a candidate for the MP in the 2024 elections. And it goes on to, to say, uh, again, in that concluding part of the statement, it says, I am therefore formally withdrawing from the contest. I'd like to thank the party for the honor done me in representing the constituency over the last four years and can assure the party of her continued support in the 2024 election campaign. That's how that statement she issued, uh, even before the video you just saw, ended. She's talking about the continuous support for the party in that constituency going into election 2024. But how will this statement trickle down to her supporters as well, especially because of what has been happening in that constituency right from January 27, when the first primary was held up until yesterday, September 9. So some who hold the view that there's so much that has happened within this period, a lot has happened and, and, and that has dipped the cracks within the MPP in that constituency. We wait to see how the party maps out a strategy of closing its ranks, mending those broken issues, and then also the heads that people have on both sides. And Dr. Kabiru Chiamahama, We've not heard from him as yet. He's looking at how things are playing out quite closely. But even before Haja Zura issued the statement and that decision to uh, withdraw, the party had already addressed the press earlier today 
indicating that they were going to have an emergency meeting tomorrow. National Executive Committee will meet to take a decision on what to do going forward in that Wale Wale constituency, bearing in mind that by Friday, they have to file a candidate. That's the deadline that the Electoral Commission has given. Take a look at the General Secretary of the Party, Justin Vimpon Kodia. Secretary of the Party. I want to assure you, the media and good people of Ghana, that the new Patriotic Party will take a firm decision tomorrow at our next meeting. I also want to use this opportunity to commend the Ghana Police Service for their swift intervention in ensuring law and order at Wale Wale. With the clock ticking, the MPP's ability. So that's what the party has decided now. Uh, but, but tomorrow they will take a decision on, on what the next step will be for the party going into this uh, Wale Wale constituency and matters arising because of the deadline given by the Electoral Commission by Friday. They have to name a candidate. And certainly that's going to be a short period for them to even think about a rerun and, and then also all that ha has to happen. So we'll see. We're keeping a close eye on that neck meeting by the MPP tomorrow. In the wake of what's happened right now, that incumbent member of parliament, Hajar Zweratu, in fact, she's one of two persons who contested in this disputed election um, yesterday and, and, and sometime in January, the 27th of January as well. And she's been described as the sister to the vice president, the flag bearer of the MPP, Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya. That's his home constituency. Dr. Kabir Utia Mahama is uh, an officer in the uh, vice president's office, an economic advisor to the vice president for that matter. Now, we will see what the position of the party will be going forward. Dr. Uh, ben Suglo Alidu Bukhari is a political science lecturer at the University for Development Studies, UDS. He knows this constituency like the back of his palm. Let's have a conversation on this, and I'll show you why the MPP may have other bigger issues to deal with, especially with the NDC candidate in that constituency. Stay with me shortly. Dr. Uh, Alido, appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening, and uh, good evening to your listeners, and thank you for having me this evening. I mean, uh, let's first establish if, how far reaching will this decision by Haja Zura to be in mending the cracks within the party some 88 days to election day, December 7 in this Wale Wale constituency, that constituency of the Vice President. Okay. Thank you very much <clears throat> once again. I think uh, this is a welcome news for the party in the constituency. But to me, uh, it came a little too late. However, it depends on how the parties will organize themselves quickly and then mobilize the support base, particularly the youth. Forward. I see. Now, if you say it, it came too late, what would yeah. the implication of this, this be, especially because of the time period between now and an election day, or the between now and is, Friday, why, for that matter? Why will she wait till now? She decided that she would dwell on the risk. Of course, she had a concern, and she felt she was cheated, and the issue was sent to high court. And the decision was made that, okay, go back and then see the delegates. So at the last minute, she's withdrawing. Fine. But the question then is, withdrawing this, uh, from the race in ASAP is not the solution. How will the party leadership in the constituency can simply mobilize the support base and amend the differences? My you, any candidate has political clout than Kabiru, I'm not saying. But the people have the incumbent power. Anything can happen. But I found the NDC candidate is more of is at an advantage than the NPP. As a So at the point of the, the party problem, Hagia will have to... I, I think it's a conditional withdrawal. It is not from... Well, I, I don't think it's coming from... It's a conditional withdrawal. That's how I see it. Of course, it's ready to use that and bring the support base of her of, of Hagia team. Otherwise, I don't think uh, they, will go to, they will still go to this election with divided funds. It's a little too late because yes, it is it, the election, an issue that has dragged over a period spanning almost four, five months, 
I saw lingering, then only last minute for you to withdraw. I think it's a serious case. I think the party will have to prevail in the constituency, particularly the vice president, who is also candidate on the ticket of MPP. He used his power and they have to quickly bring the people around him and then convince them to for a forward march. Of course, voting is not about numbers. You cannot go to the election with divided front. So, like I said earlier, MPP in constituency in Walwale should be fronting Baumia campaign nationally. But if the Baumia the candidate is in flame, then it's a true case. But of course, the matter has come to an end today. So let's see how this is to unfold. I mean, I'm going forward from tomorrow onwards. Indeed. And, and quick one before you go. To, uh, to the extent that now we have Dr. Kabiru Chiamahama, who is the only person left in this, would, would yeah. it be from the political scientist's perspective prudent for the party yeah. to just go with him or bring in a neutral candidate to contest? That was my, yes, that was my position. So, before candidate, you are taking an unfair position. And I'm told the vice president tries to convince any one of them to withdraw, but they, they resisted. But he said, okay, well, this is democracy. Go and test your, you know, your popularity. But at the very last minute, the incumbent has withdrawn. That is where the problem is. So I call it a conditional withdrawal. But my, like I said earlier, the NDP candidate has a political cloud over Kabiri. Kabiri, sorry, Dr. Kabiri. Of course, he's in power. Maybe he can use his, his power to, to quickly galvanize, I mean, the people to rally behind them and then forget about the past. The common cause is that let's win and then and win and win for the MPP. Otherwise, if that language is not resonating with the people, I'm sorry, NDC may still have an, still have an edge of a Kabiru as it stands now. Well, we'll see how things play out. Thank you, Dr. Ben yes. Solo Alidu Bukhari, a political science lecturer at the University for Development Studies, UDS, who's been studying the dynamics of the Wale Wale constituency. He knows the constituency quite, quite closely. But... That point about whether the party will take a decision to present Dr. Kabiru Chiamahama as the party's candidate or consider a neutral person because of the entrenched positions that both Dr. Kabiru Mahama supporters and also Ajazu Eratu supporters took, which indeed we saw the extent of cracks within the party that degenerated into some skirmishes. And let's put it on the screen right now. Those skirmishes that we saw um, yesterday during the voting process that led to the Ghana Police Service having to come in to take the ballot boxes. And some ballot boxes were, were uh, reportedly snatched. Some persons who interrupted the process of the sorting as well. Um, in that, that consequency, the Walla Walla consequency, this gentleman was arrested by the Ghana Police Service uh, there. And, and those who, if the situation got, got a bit worrying. Now, that is the extent of the, the cracks that we're talking about. And this is what has been happening in the NPP, specifically the uh, Wale Wale by election. That's the, that, that's the rerun of the primaries, the rerun of the primaries in that constituency uh, yesterday. Now, if a decision is going to be taken to have Dr. Kabiru Mahama go, we make reference to what happened on the 27th of, of January this year. Dr. Kabiru won that disputed primary by some 345 of the valid vote cast, right? But then again, this was what the court took a decision on and quashed this result. So this result does not hold. But to the extent that this statement by Hajia Zueratu Lariba, the incumbent MP, she said was in the interest of the unity of the party in that constituency, how will that trickle down to her supporters as well? How are they going to receive this? What's the strategy of the party? We'll wait to hear what, what happens next. Is it an that's a neutral candidate or somebody who has not been contesting either than Dr. Kabiru or Hajia be the right choice for the party in the vice president, the flag bearers constituency? Those are the issues at play. And guess what? This is not a constituency that the NPP can go to bed and say, regardless of all of these troubles, we can win this constituency. The history does not support that position by the party. They have quite some work to do. If you look at this, at least 
for the parliamentary. The NDC has won this constituency before a number of times, as a matter of fact. Won it in 2004, won it in 2008. The PNC has won this constituency before in the year 2000. And that leads me into the year 2012. In fact, if you look at 2004 and 2008, the NPP candidate who won this constituency was one person who has roots in the PNC as well. And the PNC candidate who won the year 2000, this Waliwale constituency, was one that eventually joined the NPP in the year 2008, after Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya was named as the running mate to Nanadudan Kwekofuado. So the PNC has some strong roots in there. The NDC candidate, Alhaji Abdallah Abukari, for the 2024 election, has had stings with this constituency since 2008. In fact, the first time he contested this constituency, the Waliwale constituency, he was a PNC candidate in that constituency. And I'm going to show you that in a bit. This is it. This is what we do know about this man. The NDC candidate for that constituency, Abdallah Abukari. Contested Walewale -Wale constituency in the 2008 and 2012 elections on the ticket of the PNC. He crossed carpet to join the NDC in February 2013. He says after extensive consultation with his supporters, eventually was appointed a Northern Regional Minister in February 2016. He served in that capacity for some nine, ten months before elections. He contested that election on the ticket of the NDC in 2016. Then he was elected again as the parliamentary candidate for the NDC in the 2020 elections. He contested as the NDC candidate in the Walla Walla Constituency in the 2020 elections. He is the same person the NDC is going into this 2024 election with. So from 2008 all the way to this moment, Abdallah Abubakar, the NDC candidate, is one person who knows this constituency very well. And that's another headache the NPP would have to deal with. If you look at the election trends, for him, in the year 2008, when he contested this constituency as a PNC candidate, he got some of, over 7,000 votes. That increased in the year 2012 with a little over 10,000 votes, still with, on the PNC ticket. Now, guess what? In 2016, when he switched carpet to the NDC, his votes increased by 23,851. In 2020, Alhaj Abdallah Abubakar inched up to over 30,000 of the valid vote cast in the Wale Wale constituency. That's the man that the NDC is going into the fight in this constituency, the home constituency of the vice president, the Wale Wale constituency with. And there was just about 2,000 difference between him and Haji Azuera in the 2020 election. So he knows his stuff. We'll see how things play out uh, for the MPP going forward in the coming days. This is your election command center coming up next. President Kofuado is defending what he says is a record in the fight against corruption. We put that to a litmus test in a conversation tonight. Well, this was the president, Anadonko Kofuado, defending fiercely his anti-corruption record at the Ghana Bar Association 2024 annual conference yesterday. Take a look. That there's a deliberate, politically motivated effort to signalize my government, my family, and myself as corrupt. I suspect, as payback for the damaging allegations of corruption, leveled against members of the Eswa Mahama administration, some of which have led to criminal convictions and others are still being prosecuted in court. In spite of scrutiny by credible public institutions of virtually all these allegations of misconduct on the part of my government, my family and myself, which have been found to be baseless, the leader of the opposition the perennial NDC presidential candidate continues to describe me as a clearing agent. <laughs> it is important that I, re I, will, I reiterate that I will not abandon under any circumstance recourse to due process 
in the fight against corruption. Be that as it may, in any event, I'll leave it to the Ghanaian public and people. I will leave it to the judgment of the Ghanaian public and people decide to decide whether it is preferable to be a clearing agent or government official one. That's President Kofado there, Adam Sanano is a co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption. Sanano, appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. The president is clapping back at, uh, at people and organizations that are, in his words, trying hard to tag him, his office and his family with, with corruption. He says that that is not going to wash because the evidence doesn't suggest so. From where you sit, is there any grounds for the president's position to hold? Well, I'm, 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 of course, the president is entitled to uh, defend himself if and when he thinks there is some kind of attack on his uh, integrity and credibility. However, from my assessment of the terrain, I think that by and large, the Ghanaian society and media has been very issue specific. So if it was SNL, we focus on SNL. If it was a Japan, we focus on the Japan and the key stakeholders related to it. It was Sicilia Dapa, we focus on Sicilia Dapa. It was only at points where, let's say, the president intervened and said, and maybe said, ah, uh, I expect that at the end of it, you'll be exonerated. And then additional comments would come up from civil society saying, no, you must be above the fray. You ought not to make comments like that until and unless the investigation is complete. And even at that stage, allow the institution that has mandated to do the investigation and to report to citizens to give us a feedback. Don't be the one seemingly speaking on their behalf and not giving us the opportunity to interrogate answers directly from the institution and ask them the questions that will allow us to draw a conclusion that it was a thorough investigation and what have you. Um, you can't avoid a situation if if his, his, his family, his children have been given responsibility and there are questions asked to the, the management of funds and resources in those spaces. I don't think that there has been an agenda by any group of persons so far. Because otherwise, I am quite sure that there have been many more moments where we all have been talking just about the president. But that hasn't happened. So I don't, I don't tend to share the view that the president seems to be articulating that there is an agenda to target him. I think that the issues that have been brought to his doorstep and have been, as it were, raised about uh, family members are legitimate issues that ideally uh, they should take up front right. and deal with. But, but I just want to find out, has there, has there been the honest commitment to the fight against corruption in this country from the citizens' movement against corruption perspective? Not, not so far, not the way we would have expected it. Um, it's been lackluster. They've been important things they've done, tried to increase the amount of funding to anti-corruption agencies. Like I say, if the, the gap was 100 million, and you've moved from 10 million to 20 million to each of these institutions, there's still a gap of 18 million. They will still not perform. Um, there's been some legislation, but the key legislation would expect. Uh, I have said, look, unexplained wealth, asset declaration, political party financing. Let's stop the large number of people we are appointing as members of the executive, as, uh, you know, as ministers from parliament, which then weakens the oversight of parliament by the executive. The excessive appointment of boards and, and, and chairmen and whatnot, which sometimes takes us one year to two years to finish. I mean, these are clearly it's family and friends, and then you have a lot of challenges. These substantive things have not been dealt with. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why we haven't seen the kind of, you know, results we would have expected in terms of the CPI and other right. assessments.
and, and all the others in this. And I appreciate your time on this quick one. Um, Adam Sadanu is a coach of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. There's a question that we put to you, our, our viewers, as always, uh, three hours before the show here on Ghana Tonight. A number of you have been sharing your thoughts with us. This is the question that we put on Facebook and also on X and on our WhatsApp channel. This is it. A specific question about whether or not President Kofuado um, is being wrongly accused of being corrupt because that's the position that he took in that clip I just played to you at the Ghana Bar Association Bar Conference opening. About 659 of you say, no way, the president is not being accused of wrongly of being corrupt. 29 of you say, absolutely, he's been accused wrongly of being corrupt. Now, let's look at X on our TV3 Ghana on X. 3,190 of you voted within 38 two hours and 38 minutes. 3,190 of you took part in this. And the question is, is President Kofuado being wrongly accused of being corrupt? 18% of the 3,190 say yes, he's being wrongly accused of being corrupt. 75% of the 3,190 say no way, he's not being accused of being corrupt wrongly 7% of you say well maybe president kofado is being wrongly accused of of being corrupt and that on our three news gh page 81% of you say president kofado is indeed in no way being wrongly accused of being corrupt well that's the evidence and the verdict of the people you see right there here on Ghana tonight and we, we, we will expand the tentacles and, and just go beyond here yeah, on Ghana tonight and we, we, we there are some students um, who have been sharing their experiences with us about what's happening uh, to them these troubled Ghanaian students on government scholarship abroad uh, pleading for immediate intervention. That's coming up next here on Ghana Tonight. Else they will be deported. We'll tell you exactly what's happening to them. One of them joins us right now on Ghana Tonight. Ghanaian students in the United States, Canada, Barbados, Grenada, and Dominican Republic have all expressed worry over the financial difficulties they are facing due to the delay in government stipends. There's a letter that was issued to, in fact, an open letter to President Kofuado on September 9. The students brought to bear the distressing situations that they have been engulfed with due to the financial problems. I'm going to put portions of that open letter on the screen right now, and we're going to have a conversation on this. You see, stipends have not been paid for 18 months. In fact, some of are in areas beyond 18 months. And some students have not received any stipend for over two years. Some students have received withdrawal letters from their institutions, while others have had their visa status cancelled. Female students are often forced into unwanted intimate relationships. That's a very mild way of, of putting it. And, and male students, guess what, resort to seeking financial support from older women or selling their spends to make ends meet. That's how bad it is. And, and students who have been withdrawn are not permitted in lecture halls due to unpaid tuition fees. Disbursed $50 million not adequate to address issues across the UK, the US, Barbados, Grenada, Canada, and the Dominican Republic. Appeal for the release of additional funds to cover outstanding payments for tuition and stipends and equal distribution among students. And this is, look. Except of the open letter to President Kofuado by the Ghanaian students on, on government scholarship, on government scholarship in these countries. And you recall, this is not the first time we're having a conversation like this with, with these Ghanaian students on student scholarship coming out like this. So you may recall sometime um, early part of this year, the students on government scholarship in Morocco also were on this show, via Zoom, telling us what they've had to deal with when they went to the, the Ghanaian embassy there. Pius Lord Apre is a PhD candidate on the Government of Ghana Scholarship studying at the University of Kent Business School. Pius, thank you 
so much for connecting with us here on Ghana tonight from uh, the University of Kent in the United States. Appreciate you. First of all, we we've just got information about some of the challenges that you face with what I just read to our viewers. But tell me exactly what you're faced with and what you're going through right now. Okay, yeah. So my name is Paris. I'm studying for PhD in um, business management at the University of Kent Business School. Um, so I enrolled in uh, 2021 September. So I've been here since 2021 September. Of course, I came on the Ghana government scholarship scheme. Um, so the scholarship is supposed to cater for my tuition fees and then my, um, I mean, a monthly stipend um, for maintenance. Um, so um, it is the stipends we use to pay for our rent, our bills, I mean, telephone, light, gas, I mean, transport, and other personal needs, sometimes buy books and all that. Um, so this money is supposed to be paid every month. But the arrangement was said that um, for whatever reason, the money will be paid quarterly. Okay, so that's that was the arrangement. Now, since I've been here since 2021, September, I've only been paid nine months of stipends. So this is my 37th month, three years and a month. So 37 minus nine, it means that I am owed 28 months of stipends unpaid as I speak with you. That's not all. Uh, the tuition fees also has also not been paid. And so as I speak to you, my university has written to me three emails, warning emails, that if I don't pay the tuition fees, that's if the Ghana government scholarship, whatever, I mean, scheme. If they don't pay the school fees, um, definitely they're going to log me out of the system and I'm not going to, I mean, be able to continue with my academic work. Unfortunately, some of my other colleagues in other universities have been sacked from their universities. They were withdrawn about a month or so ago. And then as we speak, in fact, I think if you check on your WhatsApp, I forwarded you one letter from a student who has been asked by the uh, UK Home Office to leave this country yeah. by 9th of November. That's right. I'm going to put and that so on you the can imagine the yeah. stress students are going through. So for, I mean, some of the students, some of them sleep in the libraries because, of course, you can't pay your accommodation. Some mm. of them have been sent to court by their landlords. You understand? Because here it's not like Ghana where, I mean, this, some of these white landlords, they don't understand anything. They just take you to court for the court to demand their money. Um, people are going through hell. Um, I'm sure you might have heard that some students, some male students are actually selling their spams. Yes. So, um, student, I know some students from Nottingham University who travel as far as, I mean, to Manchester, okay, to mm. a clinic, to just, to, I mean, to, to, to sell their spams. And the, 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 the sad aspect is that you go, excuse my language, you masturbate to get the spams. And then depending on the weight of the spam, they are paid between 150 pounds and then 250 pounds. Mm-hmm. I mean, how dehumanizing can this be? So if the men are going through this, then you can imagine what the ladies are also going through. I hope you understand. The situation is that bad. Wow. And it's sad that some people have been withdrawn as we speak now. But um, the, the, the embassy and the scholarship secretaries, no official statement has been released, at least just to console these students, just to sympathize with them, just to I mean, give them some words of assurance. Mm -mm. A friend of mine spoke to an official from the Ghana Scholastic Secretariat. The lady from the Scholastic Secretariat actually told him that, uh, well, there's nothing he can do about it now, so he should brace himself for um, a deportation. I see. But, how, I mean, how, I don't know the word to use. This sensitive you can you be? But, 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 so it's, 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 it's a difficult situation here, as I speak with you. It, it, it's a is situation. indeed. It is indeed. And, and if, with what you're telling me that you will have to do to survive, I, I cannot imagine what's happening to you right there now. But what has the Registrar of the Secretariat, Scholarship Secretariat, been telling you all this while? What's been their response to the issues? Oh, we've had a series of meetings upon meetings. I mean, whenever we have meetings, I mean, the Registrar, uh, from, from him, I mean, from his words, he makes us understand that he's doing his best. He's written letters to the appropriate authorities, I mean, where the money sh should be coming from. But it looks like, I mean, he's not minded or whatever. I mean, they don't listen to him. So, uh, so I, if you, I mean, I'm sure maybe I took it upon myself, you know what, to fight for this. 
So I started some months ago writing to them, <clears throat> issuing, I mean, granting interviews here and there. At some point, because of the interviews I was granting, I was stuck, quote unquote, as an NDC person mm. who wants to sabotage the government, make the government unpopular. I was like, no, if students are not, I mean, we are going through this, why shouldn't I talk? Mm. Because of politics, I shouldn't complain. Come on. So you see, it's not easy. Um, so that's, I, I, I don't know what to add. I mean, I don't want to say, but it's been difficult. I, I see. And you're, this is worrying. You're saying that some of the male students on Government of Ghana scholarship have to sell their spams to, to survive 150 to 200 pounds. That's what's happening? Yes, yes, yes. I can send you. You see, if, as we speak now, you can't, you can't see, somebody just sent me a message. In fact, on the PAG platform, just now, the I person see. said, hmm, right now I'm scared for some students. A friend who doesn't want her name disclosed had just been chased out by debt collectors. And he's here with me. I'm trying to book a flight for her to go to Ghana because visa has been revoked. I am, I am broken, cry. This isn't fair at all. I don't think this should be political because knowledge acquisition is for, na is for the nation. And this is extremely very disappointing. This is what somebody put on a PhD, uh, uh, sorry, you can't see, on a PhD platform. I can forward it to you. You understand? Mm -hmm. it's, it's very, 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 very bad. It's very, very bad. That's how bad the situation is. <clears throat> and even though you're saying that you've continuously gotten in touch with the scholarship secretary, the extent of what you're having to do right now. I want you to speak to them, okay? How urgent the situation is right now. Okay, why else? As we speak. Um, so, so like I was saying, because of the non-payment of tuition, for example, some students have lost their studentship. Some of them have been withdrawn from their universities. If I've been based Nottingham, 11 students have been withdrawn. Like I told you, I've been given three warning letters from my university. I know the next one is going to be withdrawal. You understand? Um, I know of other students who are facing the same. I mean, uh, there's a letter from University of Aston, for instance, it's the same thing. University of Lincoln, the same thing. I mean, a whole lot of, I mean, that, that's how we find ourselves. So if nothing is done, definitely a lot more students will be withdrawn and a lot more students will be, uh, will be uh, deported. I mean, check from the letter I sent to you, the email I sent to you. You have it on your phone. I mean, that's the person received it just today. You understand? When we we're chatting in the afternoon, that's when the person sent it to me. You can you can see it. That's for the tuition. For the stipends, like I said, I am owed 26 months. No, sorry, 27 months of no, how do I pay my bills? And so unfortunately, I the visa, I, the student visa I, I permits us to work just 20 hours. I can tell you for a fact, 20 hours can't pay half of your rent. 20 hours can't pay. So are they telling us we should do illegal jobs? That aside. So you see, the situation is not easy. It is that bad. And even with the 20 hours, sometimes you can't even get to work because look, the activities on campus are so much. I mean, you have to attend workshops, you have to attend seminars, you have to meet, meet deadlines. So you can't even have the time to go and work. That's the whole point. Last semester, for instance, uh, my supervisor wanted me to attend two conferences, one in Germany, one in South Korea. He sent an email, I told him point blank. I was like, Prof, I'm sorry, but I can't attend this conference. You understand? Because I can't afford. Even money to pay my rent is a problem. So imagine traveling from here to South Korea, traveling from here to Germany. The air tickets, the, and that was the third time I had missed a conference. I mean, I, because of, for, meanwhile, your other colleagues from Asia, from other African countries, from the Western European countries who are also on scholarship. They go, you understand? They attend all the conferences, the exposure and all that. The only conference I've attended since I came here was right after my first year. Even for that conference, it was my school that paid for me. I remember when I was, it was time for me to collect my data for my work and I had to come to Ghana. Look, four or five months after my questionnaires and my ethical uh, uh, application was approved for me to go collect the data. I couldn't afford, uh, afford it, a, a ticket. So after four months, my professor was like, what, what are you still doing here? He had to take my school, my university, to, I mean, squeeze somewhere to, to buy the tickets for me. 
So it was my school that bought a ticket for me to come to Ghana to collect the data. That is because scholar secretaries has refused to pay my uh, had refused, uh, refused to pay my my, my my stipend. So I couldn't travel. Uh, that is how uh, bad it is. There's a student, a friend of mine now, is it Lincoln University? He has to come collect the data. He's working on artisanal mining. I mean, a situation that is dying. I mean, like you know, that is so killing Ghana as we speak now. Uh, and piles, I. Uh, look, a lot of us here are heartbroken about what you're going through there. And um, to get to know that, you know, these f female Ghanaian students on government scholarship are, as you put it in your words, they're forced into unwanted relationships. And that's a mild way to tell us what they're doing. And the men having to sell their spams for 150 to 200 pounds to be able to survive. That's troubling, to say the least. But when the vice president, the flag bearer of the MPP, met the media a couple of weeks ago, there was a question that was put to him about this. Take a look. I've been made very aware of this issue. It's not, um, it's not new um, because students have even, and parents have gotten in touch with me. Uh, about the awards and, and, and scholarships and so on. So we're talking with the uh, Ministry of Finance and the Scholarship Secretariat. Uh, I think they were able to, to make some payments to, to some of the UK students and so on. But we will follow up on that because it's very urgent. Um, well, Pius, that was to you. Pius Lord Apre is a PhD candidate at uh, the University of Kent Business School on Government of Ghana Scholarship. Thank you for really making the time to join us here on Ghana tonight. And this is one that we'll keep an eye on to see how things play out. But we're going to go for this quick break. We're back. We're getting to Manifesto Check coming up next. The matter of illegal mining. Galam Sain is heavy on the plate tonight. Stay with us after this quick break.